Okay, it looks like we're reporting. Hey, everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your Dubai crypto attorney. I want to welcome on to the show. We have Jason Myers. Uh, Jason and I have known each other for a bit, but I was lucky enough to see him recently in Switzerland and got to know him a bit better and what he's involved in. And it sounds pretty interesting from my legal perspective and from my regulatory perspective. So welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you, Gordon. I'm well. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay, so let's dive right into it, and then we'll do, we'll do we'll do background later. But what's the headline of you? What's the headline of what you're working on? Headline is that uh, regulations are here. Crypto is in the middle of its coming of age phase, and there is no escaping. If you want institutional sponsorship in your crypto asset, you got to follow regulations. Just the same as if you want an institutional sponsorship in the United States, you have to file all required disclosures with the SEC. And the headline of the day is that Mika begins its phased rollout. Um, ESMA and ABA are delivering final specifications for disclosure on the 30th which is a Sunday. So I would imagine today it's on its way to the EU commission if it's not already there. Just because I, I tend to publish this a little bit later. It, right. Yeah. And um, you are now required to publish a machine readable crypto asset white paper. Um, and uh, I want to qualify that for a minute. They use the term white paper. It is not a white paper. It is a full-blown prospectus that requires input from your crypto asset service providers who must be registered under Mika. Um, and your white paper has to be filed with the 27 EU jurisdictions that you either plan on offering your token in, or if your token's on the board already, um, all 27 EU member states, right? You pick one state and they'll coordinate with the other states and with ESMA, right? Okay, um, is yeah, the European Securities and Markets Authority, right? And EBA is EBA, the European Banking Authority. Uh, the I mean, direct stands for the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation. Which so we're, is, we're, we're talking specifically about a European set of rules and mandates in, in the institutions, yes? Yes, we are. Yeah. However, it's very important that your viewers understand something, as you probably understand. If your token is deployed already and one of them is held by an EU resident, you have obligations to comply with Mika. Unless you plan on geofencing your token and taking reasonable steps to prevent EU residents from owning your token. Uh, but I mean, all 30,000 tokens on the board have at least one uh, EU resident that owns them because, as you know, open blockchains are open, right? If it trades on a DEX, it's guaranteed somebody in the EU owns that token. So how are you going to find out is the question. Uh, if you did KYC and if you passported KYC along each transfer along the way, which nobody does, um, look, it's real easy. And the real reason why it's real easy is because we enable you to publish that white paper in machine readable form in compliance with all those Mika specifications. And all you need to do is be, be able to copy and paste. Right. That, that's so one of the requirements, right? That, that's not all the requirements. You have, you have to get well, granted a license, correct? Uh, if you're a utility token, you don't need a license. If you are a crypto asset service provider, then you need a license. Right. So in exchange. Does Tether count as a utility token, for example, or is that a... No, Tether is an e-money token, right? And Tether... All under the ambit of what you're talking about. 
Yes, it does, but it's a different annex. There are three annexes uh, in Mika. So uh, under Mika, Annex 1 covers tokens other than asset-referenced tokens or e-money tokens. Okay. Annex 2 covers uh, asset-referenced -refer tokens, and Annex 3 covers e-money tokens, right? Okay. So in our case, uh, we launched what we believe to be the world's first uh, and only Web3 crypto asset disclosure protocol, which allows you to create a machine readable white paper using the guides uh, and the form template and publish it in machine readable form. Uh, you can invite your attorney as you should to review your white paper because there are certain disclosures they ask you to make, but it's common sense uh, because on the side of the application, it tells you what the law requires. Um, and you should invite and must invite your crypto assets. Each exchange you plan on listing on, or if you're listed already, they need to provide their disclosures. So it's a collaborative multi platform that allows you to do that. Um, without this, people are scratching their heads. A lot of lawyers are in the EU are um, not sure about Mika. They're not clear. Um, and nobody's really talking about it. The noise I hear today on social media is Mika comes into effect on the 30th, which is not technically correct. That's when the uh, ESMA and ABA deliver final specifications mm. uh, for stablecoin, uh, uh, the asset reference and e-money tokens. The utility tokens are a lot easier to comply with. You as a utility token don't need to provide financial disclosure, but asset referenced and e-money tokens must provide financial disclosure, right? Um, as well as crypto asset service providers. And our platform allows you to input all that. We were engineered, we engineered it for financial and operational disclosure in machine readable form, right? So cool. what, what, what is the name of your platform? It's called Pacioli.ai. And where, where did that name come from? Uh, well, uh, Luca Pacioli was the Italian mathematician uh, in the Renaissance era that collaborated with Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. and he wrote the first book on double entry accounting. Oh, there you go. That's right. Yeah. So, in fact, our Luca suite um, is where you compose all of your disclosures. The Pacioli AI validating node is what externally validates them to verify that they're accurate, compliant, complete, truthful. Right and correct. So uh, the protocol consists of the Pacioli.ai platform consists of the Luca suite, which is actually the first implementation of the standard business report model specification uh, by the object management group, which is one of the largest global standard, technical standard setters in the world. They brought you half the semantic web, right? Around since the 80s. Do they have legislative uh, authority or they have government? No, it's, they, uh... it's a technical standard setter, okay. right? Yeah. So it, it's not an accounting standard setter or a government standard setter like FASB or uh, IFRS Foundation, for instance. Hmm. Um. So once you get an OMG specification, you take that specification, it gets fast-tracked at the ISO level, the International Organization of Standards in Geneva. Right. So um, uh, it's up for a vote in June. So uh, And it's got uh, backing by EDM Council, which are data advocates, consisting of 350 different uh, fintech companies, uh, banks and fintech companies. 
So uh, we're in the middle of adding crypto ontologies to the non-reporting aspects of the specifications. You, sorry, you anticipate one of my questions, which is, does your platform, is anything inherently li limiting it to tokens? Couldn't it just as easily apply to shares? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. It was originally designed for financial and operational disclosure for issuers of any security requiring financial and operational disclosure, which is all securities, right? Okay. So, but if you're a publicly traded company, you can use this. And you're one click away from filing with SEC or ESMA or any other of the 60 jurisdictions that are... Uh, uh, that use the same spec technical specification, which is, by the way, uh, inline XBRL, extensible business reporting language, is the language of all regulators across 60 plus jurisdictions. So when you communicate business or tax or financial information to regulators and do so using the XBRL syntax, right, the language. Uh, which was invented by, or should I say, its earliest contributor was our product manager. Oh, that's exciting. So and then the... Go ahead, finish. Uh, yeah, our head of policy uh, ran the department at the SEC that first implemented XBRL in 2009 uh, as a mandate, right? Uh, which was a two-year rollout from 2009 to 2011. I don't know if that when the SEC announced that all financial statements are going to be in machine-readable form using XBRL. I remember it as it was clear as day. I remember, I'll never forget it because right? we actually experimented with it at my investment bank uh, uh, on a research platform that we built, right? Which made financial statement data a lot easier to aggregate, right? Because you, now you can make tools that scrape that stuff. Right. And, and it's in a declarative way, not uh, free form. It makes it a more AI receptive also. It is. It does. It totally does. And we use AI to validate machine readable financial and non financial disclosure instance documents, we call them. Right. So, um, I probably just confused your audience there for the last two minutes, but the, the uh, I, I, I doubt it. I got a pretty good audience. Okay, so but the point. I, I, so, I honestly, I doubt it. The and, if you are, then I apologize um, in advance. But uh, if if your audience is in banking and finance and tradfi, they know exactly what I'm talking. About. When you go to the SEC or ESMA or any of the 27 EU member states. The infrastructure already exists for you to get machine-readable XBRL-based financial disclosure from the world's publicly traded companies that trade in those jurisdictions, right? So let me ask you, when a publicly traded non-crypto company is complying with this, are they, is their account writing up their financial statements and then do they hand it off to a vendor to transform it into machine readable? Yes. That's ve very astute question. I love that question. Uh, 80%, approximately 80% of all financial statement, um, uh, all financial, machine readable financial statements are outsourced to third party structured data experts that run software that you need to be a structured data expert to use, right? Um, as a result, there are a lot of inconsistencies in these financial statements when they're filed. Now, every public company, at least in the United States, has a statement in their 10K. Under item 9A, they talk about internal controls and disclosure controls. And a lot of the statements they make are, um, our disclosure controls are sufficient for the size and complexity of our organization. But the Is moment that Sarbanes Oxley thing, it it, it 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 yes, it covers Sarbanes Oxley. <clears throat> the moment they outsource their machine readable instance document to be filed, it is out of control. So it's sort of a contradiction, and as a result, um, when it gets filed, 
a lot of them contain these inconsistencies, right? Assuming the company... Jason, let me jump in. I'm jumping in because I'm interested. The inconsistencies are errors or they're just non-standard or variable interpretations of the rules that's still correct within their own universe? Both. It's both. So you can have syntax errors, which is trivial stuff, yeah. but then you may have used a different tag in this period than you used in the last period which is an inconsistency in the terminology between this period and last period, right? For instance, <clears throat> there's 17,500 definitions in the U.S. GAAP taxonomy. There's about 5,500 in the IFRS taxonomy, right? A lot of the times people don't bother. When I say people, I mean these outsource providers, they don't bother parsing the taxonomy for a consistent tag. They just create an extension, which is not in the taxonomy. So it causes conflicts and inconsistencies, which makes it really hard for analysts to aggregate data and make sense out of it without calling the company and reconciling, right? I, I, so, I it's stronger than that. I say it's defeating the entire point of making machine It is. That well, it, you're right. In fact, uh, it defeats the purpose of a standard, a technical standard. XBRL is a technical uh, data format standard, right? So when you're allowed, I'm gonna guess that XBRL maybe isn't defining the content; it's marking up the structure. It's more than marking up the structure. It is, it is. supposed to provide meaning. Of, uh, within the content, right? Okay. For instance, um, uh, net tangible book value, well, that's a non-GAAP term. Uh, um, uh, uh, stockholders equity is a standard US GAAP term, right? Uh, total assets, total liabilities, right? Um, Profits from uh, or losses from discontinued operations. These are terms in the taxonomy, right? But what what happens is, see, in Europe, they use a DPM model, which means the taxonomy is set. You cannot create extensions to the taxonomy, right? In the United States, that's not the case. You can create extensions. In fact, the SEC on September in September last year published a new uh, about your XBRL disclosures saying, uh, and they provided a sample comment letter that they're going to send out to companies. And in those comment letters, uh, one of the comments were, why did you use a different tag this period than last period? What's, you know, uh, they're addressed, starting to address all these inconsistencies, right? Does it have teeth or is it just embarrassment? Uh, it's, both, because if you don't comply with the S, uh, ESMA, even ESMA, I'll get to ESMA in a minute. Sure. If you don't comply with the Edgar Filing Manual, the Edgar Filing Manual allows you to do anything, basically. But if you're not practicing consistent reporting, then the SEC can bring an enforcement action against you, right? What's the penalty? It depends on the severity of the violation, right? In Europe, the CEAOB placed the machine readable document within the scope of an audit engagement. Mm -hmm. So the auditors are responsible for inconsistencies now in Europe. That's not the case yet in the United States. The SEC is doing now what auditors are now required to do in Europe, yes. right? So they audit the machine-readable XBRL instance document as well as the human-readable version, but not in the United States, right? When the auditor's I mean, done... Automate this, right? I mean, this is just so much data. We already automate this. Okay. Our system does all that. And it, you, you actually cannot make a mistake or create an inconsistency between periods because it won't, the system won't allow you to move to the next phase until you've corrected the, the one you're in now, right? So um, what great. you get, it's guardrails. 
So as a result, you're outputting a perfectly consistent set of GAAP compliant or IFRS compliant financial statements, right? Now, reverting back to the white paper. Jason, Jason, let me ask again. When, when you tag a piece of data, are we, and I understand Europe and the USA are different, are we assuming that our taxonomy is complete and that somewhere in those definitions, every piece of data must fit? Or are we allowing for exceptions? Yes. Scenarios? No, you're allowing, you're, well, it's not that you're allowing room for errors. The accounts will tell you this error is not material. And that's what they always say, right? But when you, when you add up all of the non-material, trivial errors, right, it becomes a material thing on a cumulative basis, right? It's like a penny here, a penny there for the last 10 years, every quarter probably ends up to a material amount, right? And material is 5% or so either way in any account across a set of accounts, right? That's how the auditors do it. When an, an auditor, unlike a blockchain, what an auditor does is they take a statistical sampling, right? <clears throat> if they don't find any, that's, they, that's where they end, right? Don't, if you dig two feet, if you dig six feet, you'll find two bodies. But if you keep digging, you'll find 40 more. Stop digging, right? <laughs> so... Um, Spoken like a New Yorker or New, or New Jersey guy. What's that? Spoken like someone from New Jersey or New York. Well, I am from New York, right? And I'm an ex-banker, right? That was my career. But anyway, uh, to bring it back to the white papers, the white papers for a utility token don't contain any financial from a financial. You're not required to provide financial statements, right? Um, a crypto asset service provider, an e-money token, an asset reference token, they are required. A security token, they are required, right? So literally within the same instance of the software, that session that you're filling out, you just add a structure, populate your financial statements, and, and, and that's it. You're done. Uh, it's right, so literally we'll, we'll, let's bring it back to you and, and your product and your platform. You're you start off describing it as a crypto blockchain platform, and then we we validated that this is in fact an industry standard practice that applies to legacy securities also. But you, you, you it sounds like you see an opportunity with, with these new assets, with this new technology. Or look, I always, maybe I maybe always. I always knew that if a thing flickers on a ticker, there was going to be a regulator somewhere in the world that was going to require the types of disclosure specifications that we currently have for securities, right? I mean, it's a financial asset. Most financial assets, other than raw commodities, spot commodities, are required to provide some sort of financial and operational disclosure, right? Everything from ETFs to mutual funds to uh, any basket of assets that is packaged by a sponsor, uh, a stock, a bond, uh, you know, it all requires financial prospectus initially and then ongoing disclosure, right? Municipal bonds, state, city, and local governments, you know, they publish financial statements, right? So, I always knew the day would come that this was going to happen, right? I mean, look, you didn't think they were going to let us control money, did you? Uh, I challenge the assumption of let us, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And those, you know, there are still people out there that are belligerently opposed to regulation. And you've got three choices. Your first choice you can finance and organize a larger standing army and stage a coup, right? That's not practical. Number two, you can stay resentful and angry and belligerent until it turns into cancer and then it kills you. Or you can live life on life's terms and just comply with the law. We need 
structure, and we need regulations, at least if only to reduce the amount of scams that go on in the crypto space. And as you know, there are a lot of scams, right? People get hurt. So here we are, right? Uh, in the United States, you know, Gary Gensler points his finger and says we have 90-year-old time-tested legislation, which to an extent he's right, but to another extent, uh, as justified by EU parliaments, amazingly fast and expedient adoption of these regulations. I've never seen Europe move so fast. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. You would think they're all in New York. Why and how did that happen? Well, I think... You mean, why is Europe moving so fast? Yes. And how did it happen? How do they manage to move so fast? Well, how they... And how did they actually do it? They, some of their advice came from a U.S.-based law firm. Um, I will tell you, after reading the law many, many times and referring it to it always, because it's always right in front of me, because I live inside our Lucas suite, um, we just published our own machine readable white paper using our own platform, right? Yeah, Eating our own dog food. food. Congratulations. Yes, that's right. Um, I think what happened was, do you remember Libra, the Facebook coin? This conversation. Not only do I remember Libra, I went to Libra's uh, headquarters in Geneva to talk to them, and it turned out they were subletting a mailbox from PayPal. And I did a whole presentation on Libra that I think was actually responsible for in some small part for them to be getting shut down or not succeeding, which I'm actually a little bit proud of. But go ahead. Of course, I remember Libra. Yeah, okay. I totally trust Facebook. And then, they, right. And then, you know, you had the US hearings, which were televised. I think the speed with which Mika, as it's currently constitute, constituted, had a lot to do with that event, right? And then the speed with which it's it, it, it got passed by EU, EU Parliament, in my opinion only, may have something to do with a desire to compete in the world and become an example in the world for sound, comprehensive regulation. The Mika regs are an om it, they're almost a replica of the 33 and 34 Act in the United really? States. Okay. I mean, the information in the law is organized a little differently, and they use different labels for different things. Like, they don't use the word violation, they use the word infringement, right? But it's, I mean, you got net capital rules for broker-dealers, which, I mean, CASP is a broker-dealer, essentially. If you look at FINRA and... If you look at FINRA rules, Rule 1017, 1014, you look at the SEC 34 Act, right? Registration of a broker dealer, and then you read the MECA regulations for a third party handling crypto assets on behalf of customers. You've got net capital requirements, uh, stress testing. You've got, you know, it, it all rhymes with and is consistent with regulations in the United States. Right. Let, let, let me throw out an, another possible motivation. And I was just having this conversation with someone else. The I actually had this econo this conversation with the chief economist of a certain country. Their point was that they claimed the, the world is moving away from the dollar. And I said that's subject to debate by understanding what you're saying, but I'm, I'm suggesting also that. What do you think is moving away from the dollar? Might just be moving to USDT and USDC and things like that. I think those currencies are backdrawing the dollar into economies that don't necessarily want to be in the dollar. For example, a lot of the trade on the Chinese Russian border is in USDT. A lot of the transactions in Europe are in USDT. And I, I, I think maybe some of Mika's motivation was to staunch this backdoor re dollarization of their economies. I would argue that Mika is a catch-all, hmm. and it makes an assumption. 
it really assumes that anything that can be tokenized in the future will be tokenized, right? Um, in fact, the first sentence in the regulation talks about um, future proofing, right? Here. It talks about, I'll read it because now it's going to kill me if I don't say it properly. Paragraph one Are after the. What's that? Are you a lawyer or are you legally trained? No, 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 no. I, I know how to manage lawyers. Therefore, I do a lot of research and I deliver what I believe to be as final a product for review, legal review as possible. I'm the worst client a lawyer could have mm -hmm. because you're not going to make as much money on me. But I'll send you tons of business. Here, the first paragraph, number one, it is important to ensure that union legislative acts on financial services that are fit for the digital age and contribute to a future proof economy that works for people, including by enabling the use of innovative technologies, period. Mm -hmm. First sentence. I like it. it it's a catch-all, right? If you're, it assumes that in five or 10 years, most corporations will issue their securities on a distributed ledger technology, a term they use in the first paragraph. Yeah. And if you do that, Mika applies. But Mika refers to already existing directives and legislation and an infrastructure that already exists for securities laws. It's brilliant. It's, uh, in a lot of ways, it's brilliantly written. I love the way it's written, really. That's a, <laughs> you know, I was going to say the question, like, what, what's your sense of the regulation in general? So is it... Well written in the sense of logically coherent and clear? It's logically coherent and clear. There are some aspects that raise additional questions, which we actually responded to their third consultation paper, uh, requesting clarification to how they define systems. Because they use the word systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they say you should have systems but they don't define what those systems should do sufficiently, right? Mm -hmm. So we provided a couple of comments that um, further define the store forms, which is the suspicious transaction, suspicious transaction forms. Mm -hmm. um, plus, uh, we think that should automatically define procedures that protect client rights, right? For instance, you remember the Manning Rule in the United States? You're, you're putting me on the spot. I remember the name, but I can't tell you what it means. To be it, it's the way you handle orders. If you have an order mm -hmm. um, in hand uh, in a system, right, uh, at a certain price, uh, but you also have orders you're entering for your own account at the same price. You got to fill the customer order first. Is that basically and you can front run your own clients? Correct. That's yeah. correct. You right. prevented from running. And they called it the Manning rule, right? Um, I remember this as clear as day, right? Because that's where I lived. So uh, we added clarity about the definition of systems and a little bit more substance in terms of what those systems should do, right? Um, but the law is, is very clear and th they even give you boilerplate language that you need to include in your white paper in the case of a white paper, right? The other thing they did, which, you know how the SEC has its gatekeeper infrastructure? Well, in the United States, exchanges and investment advisors. Deputy, that's right. So the investment bank, uh, your your broker dealers, custodians, RIAs, transfer agents, lawyers, accountants, and DTC. Those those are your gatekeeper community. That's the gatekeeper community in the SEC. What they did was they deputized trial lawyers. So. If you make a statement in your white paper, somebody buys your token, they lose money because they relied on the statements in your white paper. They already have prescriptive causes of action in the legislature, right? Yes. So they deputize the trial lawyers as a way to further 
put belt and suspenders on because ESMA is a federal EU agency, as you know, and that it's up to the, each of the EU member states to enforce the law, implement the law, and enforce the law, right? ESMA defines the securities laws that each of the states have, but each state, as you know, has their own laws, similar to the United States, right? The blue sky laws, right? Each which state- large, Which are largely preempted by the federal order. Uh, in the United that States, that they are. And uh, I'm not sure it's preempted. I'm not a lawyer, so I want to be clear. Um, I don't know the relationship between how EU member state securities laws and ESMA rules are enforced and whether or not they're preempted or not. I don't know that. So, okay. um, but what I, what I do, what I gather from reading the regulation is it's like they deputize. They have their own gatekeeper structure, right? <clears throat> but for the most part, the, the law is pretty clear. It's common sense. Um, it's also written in our, the support of uh, Denton's, which is our accountant, uh, accountants, uh, yeah. our lawyers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, largest law firm in the world. They contributed to uh, this legislature. And... Um, so that's interesting. The, um, and does okay. And do you think it's going to facilitate the market, or uh, induce or introduce a regulatory barrier that's going to kill innovation and send it elsewhere? It depends upon the tools that get developed. Okay. In the community, right? That's a little bit of a self-serving answer, but you may. No, be it's right. not. It is self-serving, but it's not. If, if, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I would say the same thing. If there are tools that automate compliance and make it easy to comply with, then no, it's not going to stifle innovation, right? Look, sooner or later, there's not going to be a jurisdiction in the world that you can hide in that has no regulations. It's just not going to be possible. Uh, I know right? you can now. I think maybe there's murky, unenforced regulation in some places. But, Look, but you're right. Do you, do you want to do you want to tap the EU? It's a huge market. If you want to tap the EU, then you got to comply with this. It's as simple as that. Or finance and organize your bigger standing army and parliament. You know, stage a coup, make I your mean, own I, move. I, I think you're making the point that you know something can be logical and coherent and still bad policy. But what I think I'm hearing is it's logical, coherent, and with the right tools in place. Yes. It's not, it's not onerous. It's not, okay. especially for utility tokens. As of right now, without tools, there might be an extinction level event for utility tokens. Right? Because they don't know what to do. Most of them don't even have lawyers. It's three guys in a room pumping out meme coins, one after another, or just, you know, developers. And, you know, yeah, they're changing the world and they're brilliant, but business is not necessarily their thing. And, 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 you know, compliance is not necessarily their thing. And maybe they don't even have the money to hire these systems and lawyers and accountants to, to, to help comply with these regulations. But, but I, I, think, I think you're alluding to something uh, indirectly, but you're, there's, there's a reason maybe. I think it's that meme coins pose less of a systemic threat than tokens which are A, for payments, or B, representing securities. True. So That's maybe, true. maybe it's maybe more okay that those guys slip through the cracks. Yeah, but they get the most front. They get the most amount slowly, of press. Really they get the most amount of press, right? It's the biggest click. It's a meme coin, right? I mean, it is what it is. So... um. But yes, so if you've gathered a hundred billion dollars in assets and you've issued one token for each of those dollars, then yeah, now you're talking potential systemic risk, right? So, but at the same time, you're not only posing systemic risk, but you are adding support for that one asset you are, that e money, you know, you're referencing the single 
Yeah. You know, you have multiple basket of currencies, which is what Libra would would have been, and then you have a single. Uh, well, Tether's a money market now. It's not a single asset because they own treasuries, they own a bunch of stuff, short term right, stuff. I believe those are all denominated in dollars, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. They're denominated in dollars, right? But there's still a different risk profile for a treasury than there is with spot dollars, right? United States can get downgraded by Moody's and S and P, right? Because we're running such high deficits and such high debt. And okay, I hear, I hear what you're saying. Let me kind of hear the value of those Treasury bonds can go down because interest rates can go up, and they have, sure. right? And they will. Whereas you're holding spot dollars, it's a spot dollar, right? One dollar for each token outstanding, right? I mean, you know the whole controversy, right? Um, but it's like a money market. Tether's like a digital money market fund that does not pay interest. They earn all the money instead of the holders of the, you know. Yeah, I think it's a great business model. Good for them. If it's a sustainable yeah. business model, right? But money markets are governed under 2A7 in the United States. Sorry, I'm citing laws here, but I, listen, I lived under that regime my whole life. Mm -hmm. I can't help it. So, um, I don't know. Uh, they have. Sorry, yeah, I guess let's, let's focus on that. Is it a money market if the interest is being um, paid to the Tether Foundation? It, they're earning. They're not paying it out to the people that own Tether. Right. Right. They're own, they earned what was it? Two point eight billion end of last year, last quarter last year, and then another two billion. I, I think it was in first quarter, period ending March of this year. It sounds like they're a customer. I'm not going to mention any names. He's out there screaming and yelling and vouching for the company. But there's an investment bank that manages a significant amount of Tether's treasury. It's a great account to have as an investment bank. Sure. right? And that investment bank is one of the largest primary treasury bond dealers on the planet. Right? So um, I think they have a lot to do with why Tether earned money last year and this year, right? So, um, and I know those guys. So we're going a little bit off topic, but it, it, yeah, it, right, right. right. Tell Mika, me about your platform. What are what are your plans? What's next? Where's it going? So we're um, uh, we're rolling it out now. Uh, first thing that'll happen is you'll be able to create a machine readable white paper in either one annex one two or three right so any of the classes of tokens can use it any of the casps can use it right um vara also requires you to publish machine readable white papers but they haven't published a taxonomy for it yet i don't believe uh as soon as they do um, we'll implement it. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to take the human readable text in the law and just create the model for you to create a VARA compliant machine readable white paper. I mean, for the most part, a Mika compliant machine readable white paper is also compliant under VARA. Right? You, right? You just made my question. In, in the absence of a taxonomy from VARA, is it does Barra say it needs to be machine readable or it needs to be machine readable according to this taxonomy? It just machine readable. Okay, so yours is perfectly good. Right, just machine readable. It doesn't specify, here's a link to the taxonomy or anything like that. Um, okay. The um, Abu Dhabi, uh, what's it called? Uh, the oh, AA. Right. Uh, AS, uh, ADX is who specifies the disclosure requirements in machine readable form for all equities that trade on the ADX. So I would imagine, you might know better than me, that VARA is going to go to them and they're going to collaborate and maybe one day they will publish a taxonomy. But anyway, um, if, if you use our Mika disclosure model, that's what we have. So our system allows you to create a model create a model for form 10K. 
uh, publishing financial statements in U.S. GAAP or uh, IFRS with a U.S. GAAP wrapper, which is how foreign companies report into the SEC, um, or any kind of model. Sustainability, right? They, uh, there are sustainability disclosure requirements. They talk a lot about um, uh, um, the energy that's used in they also ask you in uh, to describe your underlying consensus mechanism. Is it proof of work, proof of stake? Uh, in your wipe, you got to describe that stuff, right? But if you're a utility, you usually refer, refer to the chains you're deployed on. Mm -hmm. And if you have your own consensus mechanism for anything that you're validating, then you describe that. But um, uh, we have the EFRAG taxonomy loaded into our Luca suite, which is published by the EU also under a directive. Um, but so you can let me ask you this if I'm advising a client and they need to comply with Mika and I, and I send them over your direction and they're like, What the heck is this? Help us comply. Are, are you able to walk them through the process and implement it for them? Sure, they, I mean, they don't need we they don't need us to walk through them. If you can copy and paste. You can do this. Seriously. It's that easy. And, and, and here's maybe something we skip because you, you mentioned you have, you know, we got to be careful with saying the show, but I guess there's a, a network validators and tokens involved. Is, is it they're buying the right to use your software, or your platform to accomplish this result? That's correct. So okay. we, have, we have a couple of subscription models. One, we do have a freemium model. You get one disclosure. It does not include financial statements. And that's to help the market come into compliance quickly. Otherwise, there will be an extinction level event for utility tokens, right? Um, and maybe smaller asset, asset reference tokens. Nobody really uses small stable coins, as you know. Sure. Um, and then you have a monthly subscription, right? A yearly subscription and, a, and an enterprise subscription. An enterprise subscription would be like a law firm or a CASP who deals with many, many different tokens, right? Uh, but if you stake the audit token, right, the audit token um, uh, is used on Pacioli.ai. If you stake enough audit tokens, you get a discount to your monthly subscription or yearly subscription, right? And is, your, is your token out there in the wild or is it... The it's out in the wild. It's out in the wild. Yeah. Okay. It's can out I in use the wild. Your product today? Yes, you can. Interesting. Okay. It all works now. I mean, I'd love to show it. I'm just not sure your audience would know what they were looking at. Um, I mean, I let's, let's do a follow up show quickly where we actually just do a demo. We, we it's, it's, it's too much for this show, but I'd love to do a ten or fifteen okay. minute demo, and I can even publish that out of order. I can do that okay. quickly. Okay. All right. If that's okay with you. But yeah, look. It, it, we can even do that next week. We created a model. We've tucked all the complexity under the hood. You don't need to know about XBRL. You don't have to create and select elements of your taxonomy mm -hmm. and be a structured data expert. Um, just choose the utility token model or asset reference model or e-money model, right? And then... You populate each of the fields in the template with the information that's applicable to your token. Just as if, look, you've, you've, you've written a white paper already or some sort of documentation. Take that stuff and put it in, right? You click generate, hit XBRL, create a cover page, which is beautiful and colorful, and you're done. You're done. Maybe it will save the extinction level event, but which is why we have a freemium version. But yeah. So, and then if you want reputation, mm -hmm. you'll send it out for external validation to the community of Pacioli node operators, right? And get featured on the Pacioli Explorer, which is a, a, a map, globe, right? Which uh, plots you on the map with a green dot because the validators have proved that you're accurate and compliant, right? And your white paper is complete. 
Jason, can we do a part two to this interview where we, I, you share yeah. your screen and we and we go through it step by step? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to call this interview because th this is fascinating. And I think we covered the policy and the, the need and what, what's driving this and what you're looking to accomplish. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I think it's good. I want to do something for you that I haven't done for anyone else, which is actually do a fast follow-up and publish these in tandem, make this like a part one and part two, make the, the demo and the explanation and you can show us the network and how okay. you actually walk us through maybe with your white paper, then, you know, recreate the process of turning your, your white paper into a machine readable white paper using your platform. And yeah. What happens. Is, yeah. is that possible? Yeah, that would take less than two minutes to show you. But then to explain it, it doesn't need to be the same length. I, I, I just, you, you, but yeah. I, I think, you know, seeing is believing. So yeah, of course. I, I, I want to get it so that, and you know, I'll, I'll, this will be part of the YouTube video, what, the conversation we're having right now. But I want to get it so someone watching this video goes, huh, cool, but I don't quite, can't quite visualize it. I want to get them across the visualization so they so they know the next place to go. They go to this website, they buy this token, they do, they install this, blah, blah, blah. You know, here's your steps. I think, yep. that'd, be, I think that'd be a great video. Okay. Is that cool? Great. All right, I'm going to stop recording this episode. Bye, everyone. We will have a part two that I'm going to link it to in the show notes.